So, um, I'll stop this as well. I don't want to lose the audio here. Okay, so we've seen from our last few lectures, or last lecture, how we can have formulas for each of these steps, the prediction step and the update step, that will give us distributions that whose net effect is to map um, uh, from our understanding at the time of the last update, the last observation, taking account that observation in the model state, our understanding model state then, to the current time. Right? Okay. So this is a distribution. This is basically we express a formula for this distribution. Okay? We have a formula for this distribution here. Great! We have a formula for it. Awesome. We we have a, a formula in terms of this, and in this red cross, we have another formula for it. Terrific. Um, but I don't know if it's ever struck you that if you have a formula for a distribution, as nice as that is, that's a separate issue for how you're going to sample from it. Okay? I'm, I'm skipping over a little bit of stuff about how we go from this to full trajectories that will be relevant to today's lecture. We may come back to that but I, I want to dive into this. So the issue is we have a distribution for x, the, the state, till now, this is actually trajectories here, given all the observations till now. How do we go about realizing it? Okay, so, so we have a mathematical formula. And in general, we have multi-dimensional, right? Th there'll be this formula has n dimensions associated with it. Um, there's, here we, we imagine a distribution over x, but in general, x is not just one dimension, it's multi-dimensional, right? x stretches out this way and stretches out this way, so this might be s, this might be i, this might be, you know, r out here, or something like that. In general, of many dimensions, one dimension for each state variable. And we have some nice distribution specified symbolically, perhaps associated with uh, with formulas for p of p of x, you know, the, 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 uh, for the probability distribution for the state of the system from earlier till now, based on all the observations uh, had. How do we sample from it? How do we how do we sort of capture what that means in terms of our ability to imagine it evolving over time. Um, so we have some distribution and we need to draw values from it because we may have a formula for the distribution, but how do we actually reason about it? For example, um, how do we uh, plot it out uh, and how do we go about reasoning about how it evolves. So we're going to see today two ways of dealing with this problem. One of the ways will be the one that we'll, fo we'll focus on for this lecture, and it's called important sampling, or here, sequential important sampling. The other way will be for a distribution as well, but it would be a distribution parameter space. This is a distribution in state space. These axes are states. We're asking, how likely is it that we have Imagine we're just dealing with time k here, because the trajectory component sort of falls out uh, from that nicely. If this is a time k, you know, this is a distribution over what's the likelihood we have a high number of susceptibles, a high number of infectives, and a very low number of recovered versus one where we have a low number of susceptibles, medium number of infectives, medium number of recovered. So that's what this distribution tells us, right? Which combinations of state, which state vectors are more likely or less likely. That's what that gives us, right? That's what a distribution of our state space gives us. It's that distribution I've tried to draw up there. Um, uh, by contrast with MCMC, we're going to have a distribution of a parameter space, of a parameter space, and we're going to be reasoning about how to sample from that. Two different ways of sampling. This, we're going to use important sampling. That, in fact, lens particle filtering its name. Okay? Um, uh, so the idea here is 
that we are going to draw we're going to sample from this distribution um, through particular particular samples called particles, okay? We're going to be having a set of particles that sort of as a swarm, as an entire collection, approximate the distribution, okay? Um, uh, and these, part, these samples from the particles basically are, that call, are called particles um, jointly characterize the distribution, okay? Um, and we're going to give some notion about why this works here and uh, and show how it works in this particular context. Okay, so the idea is that we have a target distribution. And in, in this case, our target distribution is this. This distribution of these trajectories. But I've asked you to sort of trust me in the sense that we could think this can be derived if we just have a distribution over the current state right now in light of all of uh, all, uh, all data until this point. That's okay. So the idea is we have, a, we have a distribution that we want to sample. It's our target distribution. And we want to be able to draw values from it um, and to recognize some values are more likely, some values are less likely. And then we have a proposal distribution, which we're going to use to, um, to draw from that. Okay. So the idea is, look, I have some distribution I'd like to draw values from. I'm, I'd like to be kind of operating in terms of this, this distribution that's in blue. I can't easily draw values from that. I, I don't know. It's not an easy problem. Okay, you have a, multi, a large multi-dimensional distribution. I want to draw values from it. How do I do it? There's a trick if you have a single dimension. You folks know how to do it with single dimension? Computer scientists should really know these things. Um, so if you don't know that, I'll have a quick digression. If you have a, I have an arbitrary distribution for a single, a single uh, variable. Maybe so you don't get it confused with the state or something. I'll call this axis you know, Z. Okay. okay. Here's Z. And we have some probability distribution over Z. Okay, we have some, maybe we have a formula for what Z is. And we want to draw values from it. You know, I mean, when you create code in Python or R or whatever, you draw values from distributions, right? You draw a value from the normal distribution. You draw a value from a uniform distribution. You draw a value from a Poisson distribution or a beta distribution. Or pick your distribution, all normal. Um, there's all these different distributions, and we kind of take it for granted these days we can draw values from them. But if you have, a, if you have your, own, your own distribution, you have an arbitrary formula for it, how do you draw a value from that? Okay, so I have a formula that tells me what P of Z is for a given Z. Imagine Z, this is critical here. Z is just a single dimension. It, it's a scalar, right? Um, I can have more Z, I could have less Z, but it's not a vector of, you know, length greater than one. It's, it's just a scalar. Okay. Um, so I have some formula for this. How am I going to draw values so that like values in here are more likely to occur than values down here? How am I going to draw values, so, you know, draw values from this distribution such that these ones are more likely to occur than that? That's what we get, right? In R, Python, whatever. When we draw values from a distribution, the ones, the ones we sample, we sample more frequently things at the peak of a normal distribution than in the tips, right? That's we want. When we sample from a distribution, we want the distribution of the things we draw from to approximate the distribution. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to sample from this? Like, how are we going to have this thing be more likely to occur and that thing less likely to occur? Sorry? Can be kind of nice, and that's a little bit like what MCMC does, actually. MCMC provides a way of sampling from this, but so does uh, important sampling. But it turns out with one dimension, there's a really nice trick you can do. It can also work with higher dimensions, but increasingly poorly. It's increasingly a sort of thing. So what you do is you compute
to the CDA. This is a probability distribution. Right? It's a probability density function, right? Because x is continuous. It's a density function. It's not just a mass function. Uh, if this were discrete, it'd be a mass function. So what you do is you compute the CDF. Anyone know how to compute a CDF from a PDF? What is the CDF? Yeah, it's the integral. Um, so I'll write it as is the long time custom in statistics with the capital letter here. Okay, the capital version. And a lot of times statisticians prefer to work in terms of the the oops, I'm not sure we call it X, call it W or call it Z, right? Um, yeah. Um, that's the integral from zero to Z of what? PDF. Yeah, the PDF. But that would be CDF, right? Like you are writing probability of Z. No. But it would be capital F of Z. Uh, yeah, we could we could just I'm not gonna. I'm yeah, not gonna because it's, it seems like it's just a probability. Sorry? It just says like it's the probability and then you are integrating over it. it is. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Y yeah, well this is this is the probability of Z occurring and we integrate that up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um for a given Z. And that probability is given by some formula which I'm not familiar with now, right? So we're integrating this up. And this leads to a cumulative distribution, right? It's gonna be going up here early on and it's it's fastest rate of change, prices rate of rise will be where this is high, and, you know, where this is low, it'll slow down and, and it's gonna be some not you know monotonic thing that rises and goes to goes to what? What does it go to? Asymptotically. Goes to what value? One. one here. Goes to one. Just integrating this up. Right? This is the this is the CDF here. So it's a, it's a cumulative distribution function of the PDF. This is the PDF. Okay, so if you have the CDF, then you're home free, it turns out. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, to draw from the CDF, to draw from the PDF, all you do is with the CDF, you know the CDF is between 0 and 1. So all you do is you draw with uniform distribution a value between 0 and 1, and you find the value of Z at which the CDF has that value. And that gives you a value of a particular value of Z on Z prime. And, and if you do that, you draw values from between 0 and 1 with uniform probability, and you figure out what at what value z prime say the cdf of z prime equals this value you drew from the uniform distribution that has the effect of drawing from the underlying distribution okay so it turns out that you can show and it's a nice measure of theoretic argument that that those two are the same so drawing from the cdf if, if you can reason about the cdf um then you can um you can actually say this tends not to work well uh, as the number of dimensions uh, rise because you're, you're, you're then ending up integrating in cruder and cruder ways for a given amount of, of sort of uh, computational resources. Anyway, um, this is a this is an aside. Um, in general, if we have multi-dimensional distribution, we want to sample from it. Uh, uh, we we need principled ways of, of doing this. Um, and here we're going to have a uh, two distributions. This is the one we want to sample from, the blue. That's the target. And the proposal distribution is going to be Q. That's the one we're actually going to sample from uh, operationally while we're in this process. So we're going to be drawing we assume that we have some way of drawing from Q. I showed Q as a uniform distribution, just because uniform distributions are well supported in libraries for programming languages. Right? You can draw between a, a random double precision number between 0 and 10, or between 0 and 100, or whatever. Right? 
So imagine that you can draw from some distribution. If you want to be concrete, imagine a uniform. And um, we're going to use that as a tool to get us to something to be able to draw from p of x. We'll use q as a as a building block, as a step toward sampling from p of x. And by sampling from q, we'll be able to sample from from p of x. Okay? How are we going to accomplish this? Well, it's a multi. It's a four-step procedure. Okay. The idea is is ends up being fairly intuitive once you reason about it, but um, to write it down it requires uh, some thinking. Okay, so first of what we do here, suppose we want to sample n values, n independent draws, n draws that are, that are independent draws from P of X. That's the one we want to sample. How are we going to do this? Well, first, we draw them from Q of X. Okay? So here, for example, we draw from this uniform distribution that's shown as Q of X, right? That's the that's the red distribution here. So we get N. And we maybe we use our built-in programming language library, say for Java or for whatever, Python, and we draw values from Q of X. Great. So now we have n values drawn from q of x. And you may say, well, that isn't what I want. Yeah, but it'll get us to what we what you want. All of your horses. So, so we draw n values from q of x, OK? Pretty unimpressive thus far. The key step here is we're going to not treat all of those as equal. Not all of those samples from Q of X will be treated as the same, or worth the same amount, or, or weighted equally. Instead, we'll weight ones more heavily if they're more like what we would get out of P of X. And what do I mean by more like it? Well, Those values that we get out of Q of X, remember we have N values drawn from Q of X, those that are in areas of this value of X, which for which P of X is very high relative to Q of X, we will like them more. You know, we'll, we'll say, wow, those are good samples, because those are what we expect to see in P of X. So we'll give them a higher weight. And what this will mean is we'll actually, in the next stage, stage four, we'll get them more frequently. Okay? So those that are more like P of X, we'll upplay them, we'll emphasize them, we'll treat them as more highly representative. After all, P of X, if we were drawing for P of X compared to Q of X, um, this, this sort of value shown here, this example X, We'd be getting it a lot more from P of X than we do from Q of X. So Q of X is just any old value in this range is equally likely. From P of X, these would be some of the more likely values, right? So we give it a higher weight, which is going to translate later into we'll draw it more frequently. By contrast, if there's areas where P of X is less than Q of X, we'll treat it as, oh, come on, we don't care about that sample that much. We'll give it a low weight. Okay, so, so down here in the sort of tail of P of X, where P of X is much less than Q of X, we'll give it a very low weight. Because we'll say, ah, we don't care that much about it, because it's very unlikely to occur from P of X. Okay? So the idea is we're going to weight these things. And what is the weight? What's the formula for the weight? Well, it's the ratio of P of X to Q of X. So if, it, if it's something where P of X is a huge number, their you know, values in that range are highly, highly represented when, if we were to draw from P of X compared to Q of X, P of X over Q of X will be very large, right? So if it's twice as likely you'll get something in this range from P of X and from Q of X, P of X over Q of X is 2, and we'll give it a weight of 2. By contrast, if there's something where the value for Q of X is half what 
that we get from P of X. Excuse me. P of X is half of what we get through Q of X. That will have a weight of 0.5. Because P of X is half of Q of X. Say this, this point right here. Right? And that will be only have a weight of half. Now, a weight of 1 will indicate something that's twice as likely to occur in the next stage as something with a weight of 1. Okay, so we're going to associate each of these draws, these n draws from Q of X, which we perform, they're all, all going to be treated equal. The ones that are more like, more plausible, more commonly occurring for P of X will be given high weights. Those that are less common in P of X will be given low weights. Okay, um, and, and so here we're going to assign each a weight. Okay, the weight expressed is how much more common this is within the target vision P, P of X compared to the compared to the uh, proposal distribution Q of X, the distribution from which it was drawn. So we're drawing n values from Q of X, and then we're weighting them. We're giving them weights that indicate high weight if it's much more common that that would occur through P of X the Q of X and uh, a low weight if the opposite is true. A weight of one if they're equally likely to occur in the two. Okay? Okay. Um, then we're going to normalize the weights. This is just make all the weights add up to one. Okay. Um, okay. And the final step. We still haven't gotten the T of X yet. But we put all the, plates, the pieces in place. So in the final step, we will draw n samples from S, where S contains the normalized weights, um, so it contains these, these sample values with these normalized weights. Um, and we'll draw each of those samples with a probability given by W sub i. Okay. What is W sub i? It's this normalized weight. So in other words, we we drew these samples from Q of X, these N samples. We weighted each of them. And now we're going to pick from those, those ones we already drew that are weighted, we're going to draw from each of them with a probability proportional to its weight. OK? Now, that may sound hard, but it's not. Um, in the argument I gave this summer, which I rather liked, I wish I could, uh, could do it. Well, here, these pens are of different sizes. Christine likes variety. Um, outfitting me. Okay, so here we have these pens of different sizes. And I'm going to tell you, it's pretty easy, by a similar argument to what I said about the CDF, to draw from samples according to their weight. Okay, here we go. And I'm going to draw from each of these with a probability according to its weight. So if this, it's longer, excuse me, according to its length. If it's longer, it'll have a higher chance of being picked, a higher weight, than if it's shorter. Okay? And maybe I'll, I'll have a small one too. Uh, is, is one of these just about dead? Um, I think this thing is, oh, it has some life in it, yeah. Um, this one is, uh, okay, well, they're working today. That's great. Um, well, forgive me, I'll, I'll, but this is, this is going to be like, um, the widget one, small one. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna draw from each of these squares away. All I do is I line them up. Okay, I'll put that one. Um, here we go. Line them up. I want to draw from each with a probability according to its length. How am I gonna do that? Well, all you do is you draw a value with uniform probability between what and what. Zero in the total length, and then you figure out which one it fell on. Right? So, so if you pick a random value somewhere in here, and you figure out, okay, which one is that 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 overlaps with this, right? Um, you figure out, oh, it's this blue one. I'll pick that. Um, you know, this other time I pick. Right, um, you can rotate me around, and and with a blindfold on. Oh, this is tough. Oh. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's still the blue. Um, 
And it turns out that if I do that, if I pick with uniform distribution over this entire range, and I see which one overlaps with it, I'll draw from these with the probability according to their weight. It's very easy to do. If I have a set S of length n of, part of, of values, each of which is weighted, it's extremely simple to draw from that set with the probability given by their weight. That's what I've illustrated here. It's very simple. All you do is you draw a uniform value between 0 and the total value of the weights, which is 1 here, because we normalized them. And then you just figure out which one overlaps with it, just like I did with this. Okay? And that will draw from those values according or the probability according to their weight. So a value, so a sample which has a weight of two will be twice as likely to be drawn as a value that is a sample of one. Just like if something was a double the length of another thing here, I'm twice as likely to get it. And I will do this not just once, but many times. Do it n times. Again and again and again and again. I will draw from the each with a probability according to its weight. Right? Um, and you know, give the little output. So the net effect of this is a set of n samples. It's not the set we drew originally from Q of X precisely. It's the set we got from step four. All of those, all of the values that we're considering. We have weighted values, right? Each value is associated with a weight. But all those values actually came originally from Q of X. Like, that's where they came from. But the weighting was determined by P of X over Q of X. And that's what determined the distribution that we get out of part four. So the net effect of this is to draw from P of X. The net effect of those four steps is we're drawing from values with a probability density given by P of X. We just do it in this four-step process, which involves, you know, critically drawing from P of X, weighting, and then drawing from those according to their weight. Simple, okay? That's important sampling in, in general. And it's a very useful technique. Again, all the values you actually get out will be those you're happy to draw from Q of X, but you'll get out those with much greater frequency, those that are associated with high values of P of X, and, and, uh, and t tend to get those far less frequently associated with small values of P of X relative to Q of X. Now, this doesn't work for all cases. There's, there's issues um, that come in, right? If Q of X is not well behaved, if it has a value of zero for part of it, you're not going to be able to compute compute P of X divided by Q of X. Um, there may be challenges associated with uh, the sort of the relative length of these, uh, how far out they stretch and so on. But for our cases, it's going to be a pretty good approach. And these weighted draws, these weighted samples, are called particles. So the particles are. They're these weighted draws from a proposal distribution that collectively reflect a target distribution. Um, and in general, with important sampling, we're kind of approximating P of X as a sum, a weighted sum of what are called impulse functions, direct delta functions, okay? Um, if you think about it, imagine in this thing here, I, I sample 10,000 sample values. Imagine that. 10,000 sample values, I draw 10,000. I'll get out something that if I plot it out may look a lot like this, like P of X, but it's composed of all these little, all these little particular samples, right? If I sort of plotted them out. Yes, the show, yeah. So the step is the same. Is that? The, the, yeah, the step four. Step four. Yeah, it's the same here. Yes, yes, it's uh, it's basically the same, and that's why if you think about it, remember I lined up these pens end to end. Yes. That's the CDF. Yeah. 
that's exactly the CDF right there, is, is I'm constructing the cumulative distribution function here, and I'm picking with uniform probability from it. So it's like it make a of a high dimension of a p of x to a one dimension of a, of a unit. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, instead of creating a CDF which is in many dimensions, um, you you basically have only one dimension of weight, right? Um, because this. This procedure, in contrast to that CDF one I showed earlier, this procedure works very nicely in an arbitrary number of dimensions. You could have 100 dimensions on it, and it would be fun. Okay, um, Okay. so um, here we're kind of approximating this distribution, P of X, as a sum of particular samples from it, where each sample is a certain value and it's weighted. Okay, It's a sum of weighted. Once and um, in this is called the Dirac delta uh, Dirac delta functions. They're not really functions in their normally uh, in their normal sense. Uh, in a in a probability density type context, they're associated with mass. <laughs> they're associated with probability mass. It's just at, at sort of one point, and we weight them higher or lower. Um, I'm not going to go into that. It's a it's a subtle notion having to do with the difference between a, a density and a mass function. I'm not going to go into it. We don't have time. Okay. So each sample here is going to be weighted by a particle. It is extremely important to emphasize that just important sampling, the whole way it works is by these four steps. So when you are seeking sample to get a sense of the distribution P of X, you cannot just use these draws from P of X. These, P of, these draws are from Q of X. To get draws from P of X, you have to draw from them with a probability given by their weight. That's how we sample from P of X, is, is by weighted draws. And this is important because any statistics you compute on particles and particle filterings to be legitimate, it needs to be computed on weighted draws from the underlying particles. Not, you know, you, it's not meaningful to compute a mean over particles that ignores the weights. That, that's not a meaningful quantity from the standpoint of understanding the distribution of the system. It's, um, it, it, it's not going to be a helpful thing to understand the distribution for the, for the, for the system. And similarly, if you plot out, if you want to plot out this distribution at some level for the state space, you're going to plot out samples from that distribution, from the particles, not the particles themselves. The particles themselves are a lot less interesting than the weighted particles uh, considering their weight. So each particle here is associated with a copy of model state and a normalized weight. Um, collectively, those two, the state and the weight, will give you samples from the state of the system. Without their weight, the samples are not samples from the state of the system. Um, there's a survival of this. We talked about particles jockeying for position. And typically, there's a fixed number of particles retained through the, the simulation. Okay. Um, so we talked about earlier in the distributional perspective, prediction and update steps. And these have implications here. Okay. Before, we were talking about the distributional perspective on it. What are the distributions, and how are they updated? Now we're going to have particles, and each particle is a full copy of model state. Between the observations, the particles evolve according to standard dynamics. They just evolve according to the underlying rules governing the system, um, typically stochastic. Um, and the particle weights do not change. Okay? We have no reason to upweight one or, or downweight. Okay? Now, incidentally, in theory, one could have particle weights change between between observations. Okay, in theory, um, and this gets into this condensation algorithm versus uh, 
uh, not using it. I'm not going to go into that. I I have questions, and I think other authors have questions about the feasibility for nonlinear systems of doing that. But um, but just be aware, in general, for protocol filtering, it's not always the case that protocol weights remain invariant between um, between observations. So the prediction step, you just run it forward. Um, here and then the update step at an observation step, the particle locations, the states associated with particles will not put aside resampling for a second. But basically we're not altering the hypotheses of the particles of any given particle. Rather we are updating its weight. Or updating its weight. So how much credence we put on it. So particles that are less competitive will downweight particles that are more competitive with explaining the data will upload. Um, and this is based on the likelihood. Um, and then there's a resampling process by which there's survival of the fittest. Okay, um, okay I want to talk about this, though, on um, each of these steps. The prediction step I'm not going to dwell on because basically it's just like running the model in a normal way with each particle running forward until the next observation. All the particles are governed by the normal rules of the system. The weights remain unchanged. Simple to implement. Okay. Now this is the key, and this is the key conceptually for and, and, and sort of notationally. Okay. Okay. So imagine we have m observations. So we have y for each data point and, and observations. Sorry, for each observation point and observations. N is the count of state variables, right? Um, the idea here is we're trying to sample here from our understanding of the state of the system, okay? Um, ultimately, we want to sample from these. This is a probability distribution that considers, in light of all the observed data from the start, the first observation, till now, what is the state of the system at that time? And this is x sub 0 to k are trajectories. Trajectories, ladies and gentlemen. So this is, you know, a given, a given value of x sub 0 to k has posits. This certain thing was the state at time zero. This certain thing was the state at time one. This certain thing was the state at time two. This certain state thing was the state at time three. Um, it's a full tr hypothesis for what happened till now. Okay, being now. And there may be other, you know, there may be multiple hypotheses about this, right? I think at time zero, this was the case. I agree with you on that, but at time one, I differ from you. I think this other thing was the case. So in the Laverian context, right, your trajectories are full histories of where the tectonic elements are at different points in time. The full state of the system, like uh, one trajectory thinks, you know, the Madagascar was located off of Antarctica at this time, and it, you know, it sort of went and, and subsequently went north, and Antarctica, you know, moved around, and and you know, uh, the uh, the plate associated with Italy was kind of moving up, and and it's a full trajectory. Um, that's what we'd like to sample. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> at a given time. We're going to be sampling from, this is when a new observation arrives. We want to sample from x sub k, the current state of the system, in light of all data from time 1 to k, all data till now, including k, and considering what our understanding was of the state of the system at time k, k minus 1. 
Okay, this is, is going to be an important thing we want to draw from. The problem is that we may have a formula for that, but we got to draw from it. We want to we want to sample from it. We want to be able to calculate with it, um, particular context, and we can't directly sample from that. We can't plot it out uh, directly without sampling. So we're going to we're going to operate in terms of a Russell distribution. Just like here, we couldn't sample from P of X directly. We might have a formula for how, well, P of X is some function of X, but we, we can't, can't plot it out um, uh, neatly. Um, and uh, for, for arbitrary points, we can't compute with it. So we end up, um, we end up um, uh, sampling from it, okay? So this is what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be sampling from a proposal distribution. There we have Q of X, which is uniform. Here we're going to have a Q of X uh, for this thing. It's, it's a proposal distribution, okay? That we're going to be able to sample from readily. Okay. Um, right. Um, so uh, here uh, we're going to have successive observations K arising, arising, and we're going to draw from a proposal distribution uh, and update samples um, according to weights to reflect the observation in a way that yields our, our uh, target distribution. Just like we did with that important sampling, we're going to draw from Q of X originally, and then we're going to update it to reflect P of X. Here, we're going to draw from a proposal distribution which in our case, this is important, will come from just running the system forward from the last time step. That's going to yield our proposal distribution, turns out. And, and then we're going to update our weights to reflect this latest observation. So we'll upplay things with the system and downplay. So we're going to also have a... Um, We're gonna we're gonna have this updating process, okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You you update when you're going to make a new observation. You update all the way. Yeah. No. When you get the new observation, that's when you update the weights. And okay, and then you said, but between observations, you don't update the weights. It's only at observations. Only at observations, and usually when you get an observation. Yeah, for our purposes, just assume it's always at all. Is it, well, does it even matter? You don't... So... Right, you're not drawing from the particles. Um, so you're saying, what if you updated weights between observations? How would that help? Yeah. I think it would only help if you, like, did resampling between them so that you put more computational effort into the things that matter ones that are highly weighted or something like that. But, you know, to speak with eloquence about this, um, uh, I will need to spend a bunch of time with Dr. Liu um, uh, and get the guidance from the Empress. Um, but I, I have questions as to even whether that's possible with nonlinear models, because a lot of the uses of particle filtering are with linear models where um, there are certain things you can reason about, project forward, for example, that may not be possible here. Okay, um, so we have a target distribution here, okay? Um, and we're going to have a proposal distribution of this sort. Do you know, do you know what this is here? Mm. Um, uh, so, right. Um, so this is our proposal distribution, and this is our target. Uh, oh, okay, something, something. Okay, right, 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 right. Um, so, so here we're we're considering time k minus one. I'm not sure why I wrote it like this, but um, if we consider all, yes, all values uh, up to and including time uh, k minus one. Um, those are, we have some target distribution for them we'd like to get. Here's, uh, here's a proposal distribution. 
and uh, and uh, we will wait for to draw from the target distribution. We're going to draw from the proposal distribution and weight them accordingly. And so we have a weight that's dictated by this. It's just the ratio of the proposal to the to the, the, the target to the proposal, just like we did with that case of the uniform distribution earlier. Okay. This is target divided by proposal. Right? It's just like P of X divided by Q of X. So things that are closer to the target, or, you know, they're up more likely with the target. We're gonna that's gonna be in the numerator and things less like uh, relative to the proposal um, are gonna have higher weights and then uh, otherwise uh, things might have lower weights. Okay. So let's let's um, talk about how we we uh, work with this. Okay. So the the ways in which um, this can be derived more readily will assume a certain value, a certain form of the proposal distribution. So this is Q. This is our proposal distribution. This is the distribution we'll use to draw values initially whose weight will be corrected. And we're going to assume, we can choose different proposal distributions. Like if in the, those earlier slides, and uh, at the cost of going back here, if we had this, we chose uniform here, but we could choose different ones of convenience. If, if, if we thought this was closer to a normal distribution, um, we could actually draw a normal distribution as our proposal. Right? We can choose our proposal at our convenience. Right? This always reminded me of a caldera in a, in a, in a volcano. So this was a taller volcano with a large caldera. Maybe we'd use a normal distribution to sample. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, right. Um, here we go. Um, so we're going to we're going to be able to choose our proposal distribution, and we can choose it per our convenience. So I'm going to choose a proposal distribution that's convenient, and the proposal distribution that I choose will be of this form this nice modular form. Okay, this is a proposal distribution for the states given all for, from time one till from time zero to K. I'm assuming the first observation is at time one. Um, uh, so states at time zero to K in light of all the observations since then. I'll assume the proposal distribution for that is just the product of the proposal distribution corresponding proposal distribution to time k minus 1, time something that considers the current, so time something which says, okay, how does the current state, x sub k, um, depend on, how is it conditional on all the previous states until now and all the observations until now, okay? Um, so that's what assume as the form of the proposal distribution. We can choose our proposal distribution as we see fit. That's the one I'm going to choose, a form of this. And I do so um, with, as, as uh, Gordon Cochran used to say, malice of forethought. So I'm going to be able to use this form nicely. So if I choose this, I know I'm going to be able to demonstrate a nice thing. And I can choose. So why not choose something that's convenient? Okay. Okay. Here we go. Um, so, um, given a sample from this guy here uh, on the right, that's that's this one here. Um, um, we're going to formulate an equation to update the weight of the particle to draw from from this guy here, which is the corresponding one on the left hand side here. Okay. So the idea here is. If we have a particle that observes this, we're going to be able to render it into something that gives that 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 is uh, samples. So we're going to have particles that are associated with with uh, proposal distribution, and we're going to uh, be able to to sort of take them and and update them to get the proposal, and then actually get the the target distribution, okay? Um, 
and uh, and then to allow us to, to draw from this distribution, right? Um, and this update step is going to take and cut the observations plus the uh, uh, plus the uh, the model expectations. Okay, so. So you recall from important sampling, more generally, we have a weight given by a proposal divided by, a, excuse me, a, a target divided by a proposal. And for us, for time k, this is, is what we have. We're interested in drawing from this thing in the numerator, but we do so operationally by drawing from q and weighting it in a certain way. Okay? And uh, earlier, in fact, in the class, closing slides last time, we argued that the full trajectory distribution is actually proportional to this quantity here. Okay? Um, so this thing on the left-hand side, this, this formula for the full trajectory, um, can be decomposed into these things involving trajectories over here on the right, corresponding things here. And then these things which involve just the current state and the previous state, okay? Um, so this was at the, the close of the slides last time. But it's notable in that um, there's some nice structure here. This guy here just corresponds to this guy for the earlier one, right? So there's kind of this recursion. This one, what do you think that is? What is, what is that? probability distribution for the current state given the previous state. Does that depend on observations? No. It's just the result of running the model forward from the previous state to the current state will give a bunch of, it will induce a set of draws from P. Okay? It will induce it. So if we have the state at time K minus 1 and we run it forward, we'll get a distribution stochastic after all. If, even if we start at one point, if x of k minus 1 were one point earlier in state space, by the time we reach x of k time k, that point will have fragmented into many particular, it's still a whole distribution of p of x, p of k. And then what's this thing here? Does anyone recognize that? Do I need to provide you with binoculars? What, what is this guy? This is our friend. It's, it begins with an L. It's a likelihood function. What is the probability of observing a given observation in light of our current state? That's on K. So, so this came out from the distribution analysis we did last time. This came out. Um, and just a few minutes ago, I said we chose, per our convenience, a proposal distribution. Right? We elected to have a proposal, just like we could have chosen for that one-dimensional example I showed, a normal distribution, or a uniform, or a beta. Here, we, we chose a proposal distribution that matched this. So if we unpack this, then just expanding this thing at the top, the weight at time k is just equal to well, p, this, this probability distribution. Well, that's stuff that we derived last time. It's this guy up here from the full trajectory distribution. Um, it's actually I should say proportion. It's not, not exactly equal. That's why we have to normalize weights. And Q is this one right here. We chose a probability distribution that will be very convenient. And it will be convenient in just a moment. So at a given time K, this is our weight. In order to sample from this guy, in order to sample from this one, this will be our weight that we need. This is the weight we have to assign at time k. And it looks horrible. It looks, you look at it and you say, oh my god, it's horrible. That's horrible. But watch this. It's awesome. Okay? So there you go. 
you got to hand it to whoever first arrives this. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. So we want to sample from P. We're going to sample from Q instead. And we're choosing Q, Q per our convenience. Um, and we're doing it in a way that's going to take advantage of the distributional structure we derived last time for P. Okay? And so this is the weight, weight we need. That's the weight we need. So how are we going to get that weight? Well, it's nicer than you would think. So here we go. What, what's down there at the bottom is just at the top here. Same, same thing. Okay? Now, you may remember from a few slides earlier, I had this kind of curious slide that focused on time k minus 1, right? And uh, the way to time k minus 1 is just whatever it is, it's, 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 it's that thing. So the way to time k is this, the way to time k minus 1 is that. It's just this with substitute k minus 1 instead of k. Okay? Okay. I actually had a slide on it earlier. Probably don't need Um. Now, the beautiful thing is, do you recognize that? Oh, I forgot. Okay. It's got to be a zero. Um, I'm tempted to modify it, but I don't want PowerPoint to like take five minutes or something like that for me to modify it. So I'm going to, I'm going to not tempt fate. This guy is the same as that one. Okay. It's, it's functionally it's the same. It's missing a zero up there. Okay. So what this is saying is that, okay, so that's W of K minus one. Well, that's a weird factoid. So what if it's W of K minus one? Now we say the weight now at time K is just equal to the weight earlier times this thing. Okay? So this is the recursive feature we wanted. We as long as we have this earlier, we can get this. And once we get this, we can do so for time k plus 1 and time k plus 2. So we're on a roll. As long as we can compute this, and we have this from the previous time, then we have this. Okay, so now we've got these things. And remember, these things are the beautiful things. I don't see you swimming, so let's just remind you why they're beautiful. Okay? Um, what is this thing here? Likelihood function. What is this thing here? Yes, yeah, the result of running the model from time k minus 1 to time k that induces this distribution. We can sample from this just by running the model forward from time k minus 1 to time k. And this thing in the bottom, well, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. It's, it's, it's still a bit ugly, but don't be afraid. And this thing, WK minus 1, this is the promise of joy, right? Because if we could just calculate this for a given K, then we can bootstrap and keep on calculating, keep on calculating it. Yes, so Alex? What's W0 then? It's the first one. one. <laughs> it's just one. It's, it's one. Yeah. yeah. Um, everything initially is equally weighted. Good question. Okay. Okay, so this is what we have here. These are our friends, ladies and gentlemen. These two things in the numerator are friends. All we have is, okay, it's not an enemy, but it's just a stranger in the denominator. It's just a stranger. We don't know what to, to do with it yet. Okay? Um, We choose Q, and that's what we're, we're going to be taking advantage of that here. Okay, so, look, I will argue to you, this, this thing in the denominator has some things that are just begging for simplification. And the main one is, it's asking, okay, what's, what's the current state you're wondering, what's the current, the, for the proposal distribution, what's the state at, or at, 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 at time k based on all previous states and, and all these observations? And look, 
within these models that we built, there's a fundamental assumption that we typically adhere to, which is a very sound assumption that, look, when we're dealing with the world, all impacts of the past are achieved through, mediated by, um, you know, they're, they're um, funneled through the most recent past. So when we're, it's not that we have to remember all states previously before time k minus one. The state at time k minus one summarizes all of those, or it, it captures all the relevant information about the past that's needed in terms of the state of the system. Okay, um, so the idea here is that that we don't need to posit, we don't need to to question how does x of k depend on all previous states. All we have to ask is how does x of k depend on the previous state? Because the previous state will summarize all of the influence of past states before that. There, there are past states before that are only captured in as much as they're captured in, in the, the, the most recent state. Okay? Um, and, and so this thing reduces to something that instead of depending on x of 1 to k minus 1, it's x, x of k minus 1. So the state at time k minus 1, not the states at all times 1 through k minus 1. More than that, y sub k, the idea here is that, look, um, if we assume, and this goes along with the recursive notion, that all observations prior to k have already been reflected in the distribution, because we're constantly updating the weights to reflect all previous, all previous observations, um, uh, then this y sub 1 to k only can be summarized as, as y sub k, okay? As a result, this thing in the denominator, which looks horrible and frightening, simplifies a lot. Instead of having these 1 to k minus 1, 1 to k, it turns into this, okay? Um, it turns into something that's asking about how does the state at time k for the proposal distribution depend on the state at time k minus 1 and what is the y sub k? That's the latest observation. So all we have to consider is the latest observation. The idea is we've taken into account all previous observations with, uh, in terms of how they've updated the weights. All we have to worry about is the previous observation, immediate, or the current observation, I should say, and the previous state. And, and, and uh, all we have to consider is how does, what's the probability distribution and the proposal distribution for the current state in light of that. Okay. Okay. Um, that, uh, mumble. Wait, this is uh, 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 mumble. Um, I thought I already showed that slide here. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I already showed that slide. Okay, I don't know why it's in there. Okay. Um, Good, good, good. It looks like I have some repeated slides. Uh, I think this came up because of the abusive uh, issue. Right. Um, okay. Okay. Um, right. Um, okay. So, so this is our proposal distribution in the denominator. And, and this looks a lot less scary because it's just dealing with the current state, how it depends on the previous state, state, uh, you know, state of time k minus one, and the current observation. We still have to deal with it. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, so this is actually the particle filtering algorithm. Um, involves uh, advancing the states and involves, in general, this Q here. Let's figure out how we can simplify it uh, or eat more easily. And this involves the choice for this distribution. Okay. Actually, this says uh, mumble. This, in a Markovian system, this is just k minus 1. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so this is where this condensation algorithm comes in, where we choose this in a particularly nice way. Okay. And 
and it goes by different names. Um, and the basic idea is <laughs> it's just it's, it's a great hack. Um, okay, you just use for the prior distribution this thing in the denominator, this thing here for the pro for the prior distribution. Guess what we use? Guess what we use? Guess what? We, guess guess what would simplify this a lot? What would simplify if we could cancel? Right? If we could cancel something in the numerator with something that non, wouldn't that be awesome? Then all we get is something where it's the the weight update process is ease and delight. Because if we could cancel something in the denominator, get rid of one of these terms in the numerator, then all we have is weights just have to be multiplied by a single term. Okay, so which one do we want to cancel with? Do we want to use the proposal distribution to be the, the likelihood? Um, draw from the likelihood? Well, you could do that, but there's another tempting one. The proposal distribution could just be the prior. This is the prior. The likelihood is taking account the new data point. And I don't think we want to cancel that, though. Um, but this one is the prior distribution. Is this looking at data, empirical data here? No. That's the prior. We can run the model. That's why I was thinking it's, it's hard to choose the likelihood function sometimes. So if something we can control, that that thing is not the same. Yeah, but um, if we were, it's a good point. Because um, with the model, we have more controls and we can control how long, however much we run. Yeah, it's. And it does not depend on observations. It's. Y yeah, so the prior, okay, so I will need to think about that. I don't have a good response to that right now uh, that's as judicious as I would like. So I will need to consider that. I think there's a problem with doing that, but I need to mull it over, okay? But what cancellation we can have is to have Q just be the second term P. Because as Lavi noted, this second term in the numerator down here is just the result of running the model from time k minus 1 to k. You're just running the model forward. It's very easy to sample from this. You're, you're just taking the state of time k minus 1 and you're running it forward. Okay? Um, and here, you're doing that for every particle. That's what that n sub i is. Crossed over. If we use that for a proposal distribution, this cancels. And that's called the condensation algorithm, okay? Um, uh, and what's going to happen is we're going to run the model forward from the last data point. At the time of the observation, we're going to be multiplying by the only remaining term, okay? What's the only remaining term? If this guy goes away, that guy goes away. What's the remaining term? It's the likelihood function. Right? That's the likelihood. So if these two guys cancel, I'm sorry my head is in the way, um, like these two guys cancel, then all we have is the new weight equals the old weight times the what? Likely. Times the likelihood. Does that sound familiar to people who have implemented particle filtering algorithms? Yes. That's, that's the standard one. So here, the proposal distribution, remember, proposal distributions are things you want to and here we've taken two steps to make it convenient. The first step was taken actually a couple slides ago. Actually, I happen to have it here. But, um, it's, we, we chose a form of it that would be convenient. Um, but it still allowed a great deal of latitude about this guy, this one here, what, what form this is. Um, That's kind of weird notation. I should use different cues here. Um, but that was one way which we used it. But the second way we made it convenient is the proposal distribution, the, the 
the distribution, think of it, you know, like that uniform distribution, my first important sampling cases, the distribution from, from which I initially sample and then I adjust the weights, that distribution is just running the model forward. It's just the distribution that comes about by running the model forward from the previous time till now. It causes a distribution, right? Uh, as we said earlier, the point at time k minus 1 becomes a distribution of points at time k. Is it not? That's, that's a distribution that we can sample from. In fact, running it forward does sample from it. It gives us that distribution. And, and in this case, since we're doing it anyway, I mean, we're doing it, um, uh, then the weight update just becomes multiplied by the likelihood. Mm -hmm. um, those are two different sort of simplifications. Um, uh, and as I say, it's not clear to me if there's an effective and alternative, effective alternative for a nonlinear model to the condensation algorithm. Um, okay, so here we have this distribution just being that. And therefore, these two things cancel in the numerator and denominator, and all you have is the likelihood, and you're updating by the likelihood. That's it. Um, so, yeah? So when we, have, when we first have the model, do we take the model and run the simulation so that we can kind of guess what is the distribution is? So that we right. can, which is, so then we can do the cancellation with prior Right, so... Because what I'm trying to say is if I don't know what really Q is, then there's no, really no cancellations, right? right. In order to right. use right. Q for convenience, right. then I should really run the simulation to obtain the prior distribution. That's right. That, that's right. No, I mean, you could, in principle, use a different Q of this form. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we earlier... We earlier chose a general form of Q that would be convenient in the sense would allow us to reason about it nicely and launch our work. And, but that still gave us a huge number of possibilities for this Q. It could be any number of different things here, depending on all the data till now and all previous state. We further narrowed it down into, into something where um, we have it just depending on the current state, you know, the probability distribution for the current state based on the latest observation in the previous state, right? But even that still gives us a pretty broad set of distributions. Um, and we are here committing to a distribution which is really easy to sample from. It's super simple for me. Just run the model forward, and therefore this distribution becomes the same as this one up here, P, and those 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 uh, cancel. But in principle, we could have come up with some other one um, that would that would you know pick a and, and actually Dr. Liu you know has some. Some, some interesting thoughts on this. But, you know, could you come up with a proposal distribution which cancels, I'm oh, sorry, it doesn't cancel in this sort of way, but has a more savvy proposal. So in other words, um, you're picking something that's not, that's even closer to the, um, to the observations. I think if the model is infrequently sampled compared to its, um, you know, compared to its, its speed of dynamics. Um, maybe it's going to be way off in the Q. This Q, this distribution might be quite far off from the updated distribution. It's kind of like, you know, if I had a distribution Remember, I had this this sort of thing, right? On something like that. Um, maybe that's okay, but um, but at a certain point, you know, let's let's envision the um, the caldera, right? Uh, 
So if I had something that was like um, as a distribution, uh, something like that, and I maybe maybe it's it's something like this, right? Uh, with broad support, and and I were to d use this uh, different colors, um, and I were to use a proposal distribution that was very very broad, right? Um, like this. I'd be wasting a lot of computational resources because I'd be doing all these samples up here and all these samples up here, which are very little value. And I might come up with a set of samples that are very low effective sample size because they're really low weights, right? Um, even more so, you know, if, to, to make this extreme, right? Maybe this this thing goes way over here and there's a blip over here and you have to do this uniform. You're wasting a lot of samples um, on areas of the, the sample space that are very sparse. Um, and maybe it would be much better to you know, use a, a, a normal distribution. Maybe, maybe the normal distribution would go nicely like that and it would almost match it and now if you draw samples from a normal distribution as your proposal distribution, you'll have a much more effective sample size, much greater effective sample size, because the, the samples will be associated with higher weights, right? And it won't be quite this. Some will be associated with weights of 0.6 or something like that. But you won't get all these ones with tiny, tiny, tiny weights. And I think the you know, the, the thought is, could there be, if, if you only infrequently measure things within a simulation model that is a lot of evolution between measurements so far, you know, maybe your simulation model's expectation, and maybe it's an inaccurate simulation model, its expectation of what to expect at time k is off base. And it's really off base. Then, um, you know, you're going to potentially have a lot of low weight things. Um, and um, you might you might do better with a another type of distribution. That's the idea, I think, in general, which makes sense. But I actually don't think for a linear, a nonlinear model that we can evaluate this. Like, okay, so, okay, so we've got to update the weight by the sense, right? Suppose we have some, yeah, some value for Q. So we, we have some way of calculating. How are we going to calculate this? I mean, we have to calculate the value of the likelihood function. Then we have to, somehow we're going to calculate the value of, of P of X of K given X of K minus 1. I know how to sample from that. I know how to sample from it. So if I know how to sample from it, I can use it as my proposal distribution. Because that's what you do with a proposal distribution. You sample from it, right? Q is, is this prior, is P of K given X, K minus 1. If, if I use that same thing, well, by definition of important sampling, I'm sampling from it. And therefore, and, and I happen to know that that means Q and P cancel here, and I just have to multiply by the likelihood. Because I've kind of incorporated the knowledge of it into the into the proposal distribution, but if I don't do that, I use Q something else. I have right? some fancy notion of what Q. Is. How am I going to evaluate the value of P of x of k given k minus one? I, I don't I don't know that for a for a nonlinear model. I don't know how to calculate that. I mean, it's it's not a nice thing. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I know. What it's not, and what it's not is not. Um, so it's some um, it's something that I I don't know how to calculate the numeric value for, it. and I I don't know if there's any other option um, for for a lot of our models besides using Q as the proposal distribution. Uh, sorry, the proposal distribution using it to be the the uh, uh, the prior um, because that allows us. To cancel those terms, and then we just multiply the likelihood. Now that I can cancel. I can cancel. <laughs> Sorry, I can calculate. Right? Yes, this idea. Uh, I have a question. 
Two. So, yeah, so here, for example, um, we have used negative binomial as the, as the distribution of the line. Right, yeah. So, can, so that's why the P is a negative binomial distribution? Well, okay, there's several P's in here, which I should probably be careful about my P's and Q's. Um, what do you <laughs> So, so we got that one. Um, uh, so, so this p, right? Um, this p uh, is negative binomial. Let's say. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That is the that would be, for example, negative binomial, or in some cases, people will use other other distributions. So. Uh, and some of her work with HIV AIDS used, uh, you know, a normal distribution of some things, or, or binomial, or Poisson, the Jin Yang, I think, used Poisson distribution for, for this guy here, and, and yeah, so this is, is where that goes, yeah? Yeah. So, is this, this P is the same of the P of X given X? No, this is indicating a probability distribution. And this gets back to uh, comments from Rick thought earlier about sort of notation there. So this is, this is, I'm being, I'm not departing from common practice, but this is indicating the probability distribution of y sub k given x sub k. This is the probability distribution of x sub k given x sub k minus 1. The p is not the, it's not the same function. It's indicating a probability distribution. But they, they all derive from the same p of the uh, all the target, uh, the target This is being used to denote, P and Q here are being used to denote that it is a probability a probability distribution. In this case, it's a probability density um, that's, that's being shown here. And it's not the same. It's not like F of, you know, this is F at some function F, and this is the same function F. It's just, it's indicating it's a probability distribution. And Q is also a probability distribution. But we, we use the name P. Uh, yeah, so thank you for pointing this out. Um, I remember talking with a physicist once and complaining about something similar. And he said, yeah, we're really horrible about that. Mathematicians hate us for it. Um, you know, um, but we're using the same letter to mean things that by convention you understand what it means but but it's kind of abusing the notation this is kind of abusive notation well it's it's extremely common though so i'm in good hands but or good company but but it's confusing i understand why it's confusing um because this is indicating this is a probability distribution that's a probability distribution probably this sh I shouldn't use P here because I understand having P and P is confusing. This Q is indicating that this is the this is the proposal distribution, right? That's what that is. And so I shouldn't have retained this to be calling it P. It's sort of you're right that they indicate it derives from a target. Yeah, this is. These are just probability distributions, and yes, they derive from that. They didn't derive from the from the uh, from the um, uh, from the proposal distribution. They derive from the target distribution. But they here are kind of using it as a general notation for probability uh, distribution, which is bad. I should I should be corrected. Um, Can I say something? Yes. So in the conventional statistics we write until we get to it and long less with this small L. Yeah. So as far as I right. understand this is just a simple like new function. Yeah. So we can yeah. use capital L to denote that. Uh, but eventually generating from PDF, right. but still it's That's right. Yeah, yeah, so we could 
we could say that this is uh, more likely. In fact, I think in some uh, later slides I do. But I think it's very important for people to realize what that likelihood is. It's a probability distribution for y sub k based on x sub k. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Alex? Oh, I'm just going to say, based on your usual target audience, I think this location kind of works, especially since yeah. from the statistics classes I took, this kind of notation is common. So yeah. It, it's easy, I think it's easier for someone uh, in my generation to read it. read it, as well as people who are having the history of statistics. Yeah, I, I should probably... And so I appreciate that, um, the comment, and that's good. It's reassuring to hear that, that um, it's, it's familiar territory. It's been familiar when I, when I uh, you know, use, use sources as well. But there may be ways of improving it so it will communicate more broadly. Um, but potentially it's at, at some, some cost. So I, I like the idea of, of using different letters for these things and, and appreciate now how confusing that can, that can be. It's interesting because P and Q are often used in this way to denote probability distributions. We just use different ones to denote uh, different ones. So, um, okay. I have uh, a question. Question. Yeah. So, when can I go to the slide? Uh, uh, this so one? Here. Yeah. So, the denominator? Yeah. In, mm, in Bayesian statistics, I yeah. see that they just get rid of this, saying like it's a marginal. Yeah, no, that's already. So, so that, it's a good question. There are contexts, there's many contexts in Bayesian statistics where you get rid of it. In fact, this this symbol here to the right of uh, W reflects the fact that we already used an opportunity like that a couple of slides back. Um, you know, like, like uh, it, was, it was in the context of this, but it actually went back a couple more slides um, that that originated uh, here, um, for example, and that came from last lecture. So it is true that often you ignore a constant that doesn't, it doesn't depend on the variable that you're reasoning about. Um, that is not what this is, though. This is, is something different. This is, um, there's already a constant off of here that, that means these weights, like, like in that first example, important sample in P over Q, you have to normalize it. Here you'd have to normalize, but, but this actually does depend on X sub K as well, and so we can't just say we ignore it. It, it, yeah. it depends, yeah. yeah. Yeah, other questions? These are good questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, another one is here. Uh, uh, why you, you uh, the red one use the red one is like a normal distribution? It's like what? Well, is the red one you have also? Yeah. Uniform? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is this is what we are using in our implementation? No. 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 My my point was to try to motivate some intuition for this about why we can choose, um, why can we choose Q per our pleasure, per our preference? So we made two choices about Q here. First, we chose Q in a way that would restrict us um, to this sort of form. The second thing was we, we chose a particular Q, and then I argued it could be simplified down to something of this form. But, um, so this Q actually could be expressed as this, because the idea is that we, we have things funneling through the past state. But the point is this Q, um, we still have some choice over it, and we ended up choosing this um, uh, choosing for this the prior. And choosing the prior meant that this Q canceled with this guy here, and therefore we just have weights multiplied by P, right? And, and I thought people might be thrown off, like, how can you just choose a proposal distribution? Well, in fact, 
Like, like, isn't that cheating or something? Or, or, you know, it only works for a small set of cases? And the answer is no. We, in, in important sampling, we can elect to use whatever, whatever uh, proposal distribution we want. And if we were to go back here um, to this, we here we happen to use to make it really simple to reason about, I use Q being uniform. Q is uniform here. Uh, just because I figured intuition-wise, all of you have used random number generation in uh, you know, probably several frameworks, whether it's R or Python or in Scala or what have you, to draw a number through a uniform distribution. You, you have a common notion that drawing uniform values is easy. It's widespread. It has support. Most platforms use, even C, common libraries, you can, there's probably things to draw a uniform distribution. There's any number of things. So what I was saying here is that if we want to sample from an arbitrary well, a distribution within broad ranges, P of X, if we can sample from a familiar distribution that we know is well supported, the net effect is, through those four steps, we can sample from our distribution of interest, P of X. And so here, I chose uniform not because this is in any way representative of our case or privilege, it's just, it's a common point of reference. And if you had asked me at this time, could I choose Q of X to be normal, I'd say absolutely. No problem. I could choose it to be normal. Could it be an alpha, you know, a, a beta distribution? Yeah, it could be an alpha. It could be a beta distribution. Could it be a Poisson distribution? Yeah, well, no. Poisson is, is discrete. But, um, you know, an alpha a beta distribution? Sure, it can be that. Um, so the point is, when we use important sampling, we choose our Q in general to be... We choose our Q at our pleasure. We choose Q to be convenient to us. It's not like we're restricted to one Q, and if we choose this Q, only with this Q is the whole thing going to work. Not that case at all. We, we can choose our Q to be convenient to us computationally and in terms of how well it matches this. If we choose a Q that is... That is um, at our convenience, but it's a far cry from the shape of the distribution, the target distribution. It may be convenient for us to do, but we will be burdened from it because we'll have a low effective sample size. We'll have many, many samples from Q that won't be representative of P and therefore they'll have very low weights. By contrast, if we use a Q, like this one here, this normal distribution, that's closer to, in shape, to the distribution we want to sample the target, we will actually be better off in terms of effective sample size, because we'll have lots of weights which have high weight. They will not have really low weight, and therefore we'll, we'll have for a thousand weights, we'll have a much larger effective sample size. Maybe we'll have an effective sample size of 750. Instead of with a uniform distribution, you're so different from what's on the board for the target distribution, we might have a very low effective sample size, 100 for a thousand particles, because there's such low weights associated with them. And this bears on particle filtering. Particle filtering, we choose our proposal distribution. That's what we were just going through. We, we restrict it to be out of convenience. Thus is our right with, with important sampling. We choose our proposals. That is our prerogative with, with important sampling. We chose our important sampling to be convenient in terms of what allow us to do for important sampling. That's great. Is it possible that we will have to bear the consequences? of that that are adverse? Yes. Just as here, my choice of a uniform would have been very convenient, but burdensome in terms of low effective sample size. 
it is possible that with particle filtering, our choice of using the condensation algorithm, using the proposal distribution being the prior, will be convenient, but burdensome in the sense of having a low effective sample size. And particularly, if our frequency of updates, frequency of observations is very low compared to the rate at which the model evolves, and where the model is quite inaccurate, it may be, we may be proposing a prior distribution for model states generated by running the model forward, running the model forward, you know, um, here uh, to, uh, you know, by, by choosing this proposal distribution here to be equal to this, by running the model forward to con k minus 1 to time k, we may be getting a distribution that is a very poor match to the actual distribution, the target distribution we are seeking to match, which is the target distribution, um, uh, mumble, mumble, mumble. Um, so we're seeking to sample from um, target di this target distribution, right? Um, this is the target distribution, and um, if we're seeking a sample from this, maybe it's a very nice, convenient way of, of doing particle filtering that uses the condensation algorithm, uses the prior as the proposal, but it may yield weights that are, are mostly small because the model's predictions running for such a long time without an observation, maybe being an accurate model, maybe way off, way off from what the observations suggest. So in other words, we may get many low-rated particles because our likelihoods are very small. And that may mean our effective sample size is small. And guess what we're going to have to do frequently? Resample. Resample. We're going to need to perform resampling. And seeing if I can tie that in didactically to this. So this is this case on the board drawn from, I think it maps directly. So forgive me, I, I hadn't anticipated doing this, but I think I'm going to do I'm going to do something that it was not my intention. So suppose we go through this four-step procedure, right? We want to draw from P of X, we draw instead from from Q of X. We draw, you know, ten thousand particles, right? Um And um, maybe just just for the sake of illustration, I I hate to do this, but um, but um, maybe for the sake of illustration, I could <laughs> I can imagine this is our Q of X. So we have a proposal distribution which is very. <laughs> what do you think? Um, that's pretty good. Um, we have something like this. Imagine that we have a so um, uh, poor match um, of proposal distribution, right? Um, to target. Um, by the way, it's going to take quite some time now. Um, okay, so um, so suppose we have this. And we draw 10,000 data points from Q of X. We're going to be drawing. I mean, Q of X is just a uniform distribution. That wasn't bad. Um, we're going to be drawing a lot from out this region, right? And we're going to be drawing some from this region over here. 
where p of x is basically almost zero. We're going to be drawing a lot. There's going to be a lot of particles because of that where p of x over q of x is going to be very small. They're going to have very, very low weights, right? The, the, the weights associated with these particles way out here, way out here are going to be small. Suppose we draw 10,000 particles from them. Maybe 6,000, 7,000 are going to be essentially zero weights. And then we're going to have some which have some weights. In terms of, and then we go on to step, you know, step three and step four. And by the time we get to step four, if we draw n particles from these, um, you know, we're going to be sampling almost entirely from this region, right? From this region where this this has has some some things. So we're going to be carrying around. If we think about carrying around these ten thousand particles to sample from, we're going to be carrying around this bag full of almost useless particles. Thousands, like seven thousand of them, we're going to be essentially useless, just so we can dole out those in a small area of the space, right? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of waste. Imagine a million samples, a billion samples. You've got to store them all. You're storing all these things that are almost zero weight. And really, you don't have too many of the areas you care about. Right? Like, like the number of samples that you might have, two, three thousand or something of, of, of the ones you care about in this region. And so your ability to resolve that region, to kind of distinguish these crenulations and so on of this region are very impaired. Because you've got so many that are low, that are, that are so low weight, low weight, right? So, so what to do? What to do? Well, what you do is resampling. So, so instead of carrying around all of these with, you know, all these 10,000, only a small set of which, subset of which are really all that relevant, now suppose from that you could draw, you know, 10,000 according to their weight, you're going to get mostly those in this region, right? And then you treat those all as basically equal, weight one, and um, and and you use those as as the set that you use, and that's more efficient because you have a you have a much you have a sampling from from this area that's um, where your samples are from meaningful areas of the space from the standpoint of your target distribution. I'm trying to draw an analogy to resampling and particle filtering. That's kind of the flavor of it. But we do it and with a system that's evolving. So it's sequential important sampling. Instead of just at one time, it's a little bit it's a little bit uh, contrived. But if we if we have an evolving system, maybe we resample re and then it evolves more. And those ones that used to be the same sample from here just the same sample we got again and again and again and again. Um, instead of that being the same sample, they're divergent because of the stochastics. And so they become rich and, and varied. And, and, uh, and, and, and we carry around a more meaningful set. So that's one of the reasons we do this instead of carrying around a ton that are a low effective sample size. And my point earlier in response to the question of the chart, yeah, is just that um, it's possible in a model where it's infrequent updates and or the model is very inaccurate. The model could be really far off. And so using its proposal distribution as the prior distribution, this is the prior up here, and using that for the proposal distribution may lead to a lot of low weight things where we have to resample a lot. Does that make sense? And it's not fatal, but it, you know, it may mean you use 20,000 particles for really, if you could ideally use 2,000 or something like that. I mean, it's a computational burden. 
Okay, um, so that's the condensation algorithm. Um, and so here we just let's block out the light here. Right. Um, oh. Okay, I wish I wish I could. Let's hope it doesn't crash. Um, yes. Um, uh, and boy, does my throat feel like I wish I could press the home button and teleport. Um, so, um, okay, so condensation. The central choice here is the likelihood function. The likelihood function expresses the likelihood of observing the empirical data in light of postulated model state. This is a postulated model state at time k. This is what we observe, and it's asking us to update the weight by multiplying for a given particle the probability, the likelihood of observing the empirical datum in light of that particle state. That particle state at the current time. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's fine. Do you, do you change your likelihood function at all throughout the model? Or does it stay? Stays the same. Stays the same. Um, I don't actually know that it would be mathematically legitimate to, 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 to modify it, actually. Um, it's an interesting question. It's a very interesting question. Um, so, yeah, given given our view of particle filtering, it's a kind of survival of the fittest, where you have these particles jockeying for survival, for, for success. Our likelihood function basically dictates what does fitness mean, right? Sort of how fit is a particle, how good a fit it is. And um, you know, choice of the likelihood function is is very important. And uh, you know, binomial negative, binomial normal, Poisson. Um, these are are not unfamiliar ones. Um, and you know, if you're dealing with multiple types of observation, you could have a multi-dimensional likelihood, or you could have a product of likelihoods, um, um, product of observation specific likelihoods. And there's there's trade-offs um, here. Um, particle filtering is very amenable to streaming solutions, solutions which deliver each particle, new observation, I should say, vector as it arrives, because it's recursively defined. When you, all you do is you update it based on the new observation, you update, you know, the weight of each particle. You don't have to consider all previous observations, you just consider for the current model understanding of what should be the case now with this particle, for, for that particular particle, what's the likelihood I've observed this new data, just the new observation vector, and I update that particular particle's weight by multiplying by that likelihood. Is this because my XK contains the information from the past already? Yeah. We are updating X. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. But that X of K here has been shaped by, honed by, carved by, um, uh, refined by, um, the observations earlier. So we're dealing with something where a lot of the dross has been burnt off. Um, it's like we're subjecting the model's understanding of what's the case now, x of k, in the crucible of empirical evidence. And in that flame of empirical evidence, it burns off the impurities and leaves <coughs> pure gold. And, um, and that's, what, that's what's remained. It's, it's, it's leaving you know, uh, an understanding of X of K. I mean, I, I, I speak in, in um, forward ways, but it's leaving an X of K which has been refined by all previous observations. So, and that's very important. That's why we only have to take into account Y sub K, because the previous observations have shaped X sub K, the distribution of X sub K, and shaped it in ways that incorporate their knowledge. So we don't have to consider all the earlier ones. I have another question. Question. So, um, yes, like in the hidden Markov model, when you say like um, yeah. it just depends on the immediate previous state. 
Yeah. So is this how it's different from hidden Markov model and particle filtering? I'll make comments. Thank you for that question. It's a very significant question. I'd like to answer that in the opening minutes of the next session rather than now. Because it's actually, there's a couple dimensions it differs. And understanding those dimensions can be very useful for understanding each of those two methods, hidden markup models on the one hand and particle filtering on the other, how they differ. But they differ in, in a couple of ways. I mean, probably the most, some of the most basic are, yeah. That with with common with HMM, HMMs you have categorical state and here you have continuous state. Yeah. But it's more than that um, because you do have um, um, you, you you also have some uh, much greater generality with uh, the models you're using here, and you're sampling from a distribution over that rather than just having a uh, a probability factor over the different um, uh, the different uh, states here. You're you're actually sampling from them. Um, you can perform particle filtering with an HMM, or you can perform something like particle filtering with an HMM, which would be pretty interesting, actually. But uh, the HMM, something like particle HMM, yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, Right. I mentioned the low effective sample size, the resampling step, we update, this is part of the Shaoyan uh, illustration, we, we basically with resampling, if the effective sample size gets too low for carrying around too many low weight things, um, we, we go through and we draw from the particles according to their weight, so the likelihood uh, of a particle being selected is given by the weight. Um, and that gives us a new set of particles. And some of the particles with low weights have died out. Some of the particles with high weights have multiplied. And then those particles all run for the new set of particles that were drawn until we get a too low effective sample size. And it's important to understand, because it's a stochastic model, the ones that were cloned and multiplied, they diverge. And so they're not always going to stay the same. For a determinist model, they say the same. And so we go through these resampling steps with it. Oh, after resampling, all the weights are set to one. They're all normalized. They don't, they don't continue at the earlier weights. They're set to one. They're all considered equal at that point. Um, if you're going to compute statistics over model quantities, you do them over samples from the weighted particles. Samples from these particles, not you don't you don't compute the mean over all particles. You compute the mean over samples from the particles, where the samples are drawn with probability according to the weights. It's very very important. Otherwise, it's not meaningful. Um. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Um. That's all I have time for today. I was hoping to get to MCMC, but that will have to be left till next time. Okay. Um, I asked Christine to schedule another one, and my guess is they'll be... Christmas day. <laughs> <laughs> what a Christmas present. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go on to, uh, to MCMC and then Particle MCMC and wrap that up. Thank you very much. And now... I normally have office hours following this, uh, but if people don't mind because my throat is so raw, I think I'm going to try to, to keep my utterances for the next uh, hour, and, hour and a half to my next class to a minimum. Um, so uh, if you have short questions, I could answer them, but otherwise I will rest. Ooh.